but just because they like they got kind of okay. out stars and so okay. it's gonna be okay. five if that's all right. <laughs> it's okay, welcome everybody. Um, before we get started, um, I'll just quick highlight the upcoming um, Grand Round sessions, obviously a faculty meeting, um, Dr. Eder and Rubenfeld, uh, Rasha Alami, and then John Spurt is coming up in March. So I'll start off by introducing Dr. Suveen Angral. He's currently a second year cardiology fellow. He completed his medical school from the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi where he was deeply interested in the utilization of healthcare and education through social media. During medical school, he was the content associate and social media manager for Ambition Me, an education delivery startup. He then joined Credi Health, a health delivery startup as the operations associate. Credi Health became a very successful enterprise and was labeled as the Google of healthcare in India. After medical school, he joined CORE at Yale as a research associate focusing on machine learning applications in healthcare and healthcare utilization. He completed his internal medicine training at the University of Missouri in Kansas City before joining us here at Yale. Next, Dr. Imran Gar is also currently a second year cardiology fellow. He grew up in Arizona with his family before moving here to Yale for medical school. He then went just a bit north to Boston for his internal medicine residency at the Brigham and then came back to join us at Yale for his cardiology fellowship. And in his spare time, Imran loves to play soccer and board games. Now I'll hand it over uh, to Suveen to kick things off. All right. Well, hello everyone. Welcome. Uh, so today's topic um, came off just to make education more interesting and more engaging. Um, Imran and I were discussing how to best portray cardiovascular education. Now that social media has been traditionally used a lot. We use it a lot. I see many familiar faces here or who are on Twitter. Um, so we thought we would sort of collect uh, different tweets from um, different studies that were published in cardiology and then just sort of summarize and uh, put a lens on like how Twitter is used in um, among cardiologists. So, um, you know, our learning objectives for today would be assess how Twitter is being utilized by cardiologists. We'll do critical appraisal of the medical con uh, content on Twitter. Uh, we'll identify the advantages and disadvantages of Twitter and medicine. And then we'll compare the conclusion uh, on Twitter to the guidelines. Now, uh, Twitter is uh, pretty prevalent among cardiologists. Uh, just a screenshot, this is Dr. Nihar Desai. Um, you know, he's on Twitter, he has a decent following, um, really nice profile picture, and he only has one tweet. He has only tweeted one thing, and you can never guess what he has tweeted. Uh, anyone wants to take a blind guess what avenue he has tweeted on? Something about the eagles. Something about the eagles. No, he has tweeted Baba Ramdev, and you might be wondering what the heck or who the heck is this guy? Um, this is this Indian guru and businessman. And I don't know what that tweet means. I've been meaning to ask him, but I don't know. Yeah, this is the only thing that he has tweeted. This guy has like a wacky TV program where he goes on these like eccentric tirades about government and then Indian scriptures. Um, you know, um, Ed Miller is on uh, on Twitter. This is our uh, program director. A pretty hefty following, I must say. Uh, really nice picture. Uh, one of his tweets is this tweet. This is our um, uh, fellows, uh, Andy, Max, uh, Inga, and Evan, uh, just rocking it in front of a Rolls Royce. And I must say, this is a pretty fire picture. Uh, and if you... Uh, sort of go over like uh, this tweet, this reached around 600,000 people. Um, so pretty, went, went viral. Uh, some of the subtweets from this were like, <laughs> you're paying them too much. Uh, to which Dr. Miller, you know, smartly replies, thank you for giving me opportunity to share that Yale has the highest rated, highest uh, trainee salary in the US. And then this also went viral in, um, uh, in, in among the international students. 
someone from Turkey stated we are miserable in Turkey. And then uh, one of them said, uh, Sadaki my type. And if you don't know what that means, uh, Sadaki means the right one. So shout out to Evan. Uh, so, you know, uh, we, we use Twitter both for education and highlight our personal life. So let's pivot from here and just pick one topic uh, that has been uh, used uh, or debated in, uh, on Twitter a lot, and that's uh, coronary artery calcium scoring. So um, I want to highlight this tweet from Dr. Martha Gulati, another very famous cardiologist on Twitter, where she is tweeting about uh, a particular grand rounds that Dr. Kuram Nasir did. Uh, Kuram Nasir was one of our cardiology graduates from our program um, on the utilization of CAC scoring. And um, her conclusions were, um, or based on the talk, were um, our respirators haven't really changed. We should follow the atherosclerosis using the Sutton's law, and then the power of zero, which Kuram is very passionate about. Now, uh, just a little bit of history. So CAC scoring developed in 1990. Um, it uses uh, this approach where every lesion has uh, is graded based on Hounsfield unit and attenuation and integrates volume um, to give a score, um, higher the score, higher the uh, AS, uh, atherosclerosis burden. And then if you look at the initial evidence supporting uh, coronary artery calcium score, uh, there were many sm like small studies that were published after it was introduced. Uh, the biggest study was the MESA study, uh, which uh, in enrolled over 6,700 people uh, with no clinical cardiovascular disease entry and then followed them prospectively. Um, the results were published in 2008 and it did show like the higher your CAC score, the higher is your um, uh, probability of having a coronary event. And then eventually our 2019 guidelines were uh, updated. Uh, we won't go through all of this, but I do wanna highlight that uh, CAC scoring comes in here with like intermediate risk of 7.5 to 20%. And then it says, you know, you, you, you can include it if uh, decision is uncertain. Uh, can you see my marker? Okay, never mind. Um, all right, so let's uh, let, let's come back to that tweet. Um, so let's see what the perception was of different cardiologists on this particular tweet. Um, and they were pretty extreme ones. I, I must say I was surprised. Um, Dr. Uh, David Brown says, so many PowerPoint slides and so little RCT data. Oh, and it was, <laughs> I mean, true. Uh, uh, <laughs> And then this is not the first time Dr. Brown has commented on this. We, we dig a little deeper and found another tweet back in uh, 2002 where he's like, I've listed all the RCT data demonstrating use of CAC scoring that improves patient outcomes, just puts like five dots on it. Um, and to which uh, Kuram replies with a yawning emoji. <laughs> so really going back and forth on like <laughs> what this is. So now that's true, like, you know, we use clinical trial as cornerstones for our clinical decision making. Uh, and that's true, like CAC scoring on, on clinical trials, we don't have much data. We do, however, have data on clinical trials. This is the Eisner study. Um, this was a prospective randomized controlled trial, which um, not a mortality trial, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, this was uh, to compare the clinical impact of conventional risk factor modification to that with like CAC scoring, if you if you want to use it. So 2,000 pay, uh, volunteers were uh, assigned to scanning or no scanning. Um, and then the endpoint was four-year change in risk factors and Framingham risk score. So, so not a mortality trial. And they also looked at downstream resource utilization. Now, um, what did they find? Um, this is an interesting way of like presenting conclusions on uh, on the uh, on the trial abstract, but this is exactly how they presented. They just gave a bunch of p values. Um, they said that uh, systolic blood pressure, uh, LDL, waist circumference, and tendency to lose weight was better in the uh, in the CAC screening group. Now uh, they also gave Framingham risk score uh, uh, that it was significantly improved. Um, and then um, once you start like looking at, at the data, like what exactly was 
the statistic, statistical uh, significance in the abstract, and then what was the clinical significance when you start digging into the data. So this is the uh, like the table two where they talk about different um, uh, results. And then when you start looking at the blood pressure, uh, the change in the LDL, and then the weight loss, which are significant, the deltas are pretty similar. You know, like uh, it's um, negative five in the no scan group in uh, systolic blood pressure to negative seven. And then in the bracket, it's the uh, interquartile range with 25 to 75% uh, 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 confidence interval. Um, and the same goes for LDL and, and the weight. So, um, you know, someone tweeted out this trial and then people started debating on Twitter about this trial as well. So uh, Dr. Cohen said, okay, not a mortality trial and duration only four years. Um, so, uh, and then he just quotes that compared with no scanning, uh, randomization uh, to CAC scoring was associated with superior risk factor control. And then Dr. Uh, Greg Fonro from UCLA commented, so which prospective randomized trials have demonstrated a reduction in the clinical event with the CAC scoring? And he points out exactly what we looked at in the previous table that the reduction in LDL was only six, which for us as a cardiologist is not too much. We like to aim for much higher. Uh, and then, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Brown comes back and says, Greg, it's hopeless. This is a religion and not a scientific discipline. <laughs> so uh, you can see like there's pretty, I, I want to say wide array of um, responses and uh, thoughts behind uh, CAC scoring and how to integ integrate that to preventive cardiology. Now, uh, I, I do want to just, just go back and also highlight one more thing that people didn't tweet enough about in the Eisner trial uh, was, you know, just utilization of medications. And once you start looking at that particular data, you see that the lipid meds, aspirin, some of the meds that we commonly use and uh, were, were not that diff like different between the two groups. Um, just something to keep in mind. Um, but again, not a mortality trial, only five-year follow-up. Now, uh, uh, of course, people were still debating when this trial came out. So let's go back to uh, Dr. Cohen's tweet, which says, so if someone with like Framingham risk score of five happens to have score of 100, do we ignore them? And if someone has a 10%, do we treat them with, with, with a statin? Is that enough? Then he invites everyone to brunch dates um, in an Ethiopian restaurant. <laughs> and then he follows that up with, uh, since most patients in the primary prevention trials don't have events, um, how do you make a decision? Do you not treat them? And that's a very important thing that I think was missing from, from all these like tweets that came out on CAC scoring was how do you power a primary prevention trial, right? So you're not powering for a particular mortality because you're trying to prevent that event from happening. So how, so the methodology and our thoughts on primary prevention trials they need to be more, you know, collective and uh, more thought out. But you know, we are seeing some data on this. Uh, so when Dr. Cohen tweeted this out, when all this bickering was going on, uh, Kuram uh, came back and tweeted, uh, "Common sense is a rare gift. You should cherish it." <laughs> so, so, so people have thoughts, uh, and then just. <laughs> And then if you start looking at, uh, I just want to highlight one more uh, study. Uh, it's this Danish uh, trial. Um, only men, longer follow-up. Uh, this was powered for uh, mortality. Um, and, it, and just one piece of evidence, they did include CAC scoring, but they also included other stuff like ABIs. They did a whole bunch of lab testing. And it did not show a significant difference in death, but only men, five-year follow-up, not just CAC scoring, other things. So we're still waiting on a 10-year trial on CAC scoring. Um, me and Kuram is also waiting. Just <laughs> All right. So let's uh, um, you know, put a lens to all this that we learned, right? So we saw that there are like two major um, sort of buckets on people when they were debating CAC scoring. And that's true, not just for CAC scoring, but for like pretty much everything in, in, in cardiology. 
um, some cardiologists have very high social media following, some don't, some have, you know, so some are very active in broadcasting their thoughts on Twitter. Um, and I, I found one uh, paper, which I thought was very interesting that talks about the Kardashian index. Um, if you plot citations uh, and uh, the number of followers, and then you see there are some researchers, this is not cardiologists, there are some researchers who have way higher um, followers, but not as many uh, citations. Uh, the paper labels them as the Kardashians. Um, and the way they index it is they uh, create this, um, this formula, which where FA is the actual number of critter followers and C is the number they should have based on the number of citations. And if your uh, K index is more than five, you are a Kardashian and researcher. And if it's less than five, then you're good. That's not my conclusion. That's just what the paper says. Uh, of course, we looked at how many, uh, what's the index in cardiologists. So pretty good, actually, I would say. Only like 21 had a um, K, K index of more than five. Most fall below five. Uh, just thought it was a, a interesting piece of innovation. All right, let's get back to business. Um, Coffee is business for me, if uh, if you're wondering why. <laughs> so let's talk about one other topic that was very much debated, and uh, crux of it is at Yale, um, and that was the hospital readmission reduction program. No, Dr. Spatz is looking at me. <laughs> so uh, those of you who don't know, um, uh, th this is a uh, Medicare value-based program, uh, which was uh, part of the Affordable Care Act when it was enrolled in 2010. Um, uh, the thought being that um, in order to reduce readmissions, we're gonna penalize the hospitals who have higher than the national average of 30-day re readmission rate for these specific um, diseases. So uh, your AMI, heart failure, cabbage, uh, COPD, uh, and then um, elective uh, hip and knee arthroplasty. And then uh, it, the results were pretty promising. Uh, this is a, uh, a figure from Zucker et al. that was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so the f uh, they did an interpret time series analysis. And you can see the first dotted line is when the policy was announced, not introduced. And the moment it was announced, the readmission started decreasing, both for the targeted conditions in blue and then the non-targeted conditions in the red. Um, and then after it was enrolled in uh, 2012, we saw that it, it stayed steady. So the uh, effects on reduction of readmission happened as soon as it was it, uh, announced, not introduced. Uh, so then this article was published in New New York Times, which said that did this healthcare policy do harm? Um, this was published in December of 2018. So there were some uh, people that were questioning, is it a valid healthcare policy or not? So let me take you back to 2017. This is a year before this New York Times article was published. And then uh, this particular tweet from JAMA Cardiology, which says that, implementation uh, of the program to reduce hospital readmission associated with increase in death among heart failure patients, specifically heart failure. Um, and then this was a MedPage report. And of course, people picked up on this and uh, very passionately. Uh, this is Dr. Fonro from UCLA says, uh, will CMS reconsider? And um, JAMA Cardiology tweeted this out, uh, this MedPage uh, report based on this particular uh, paper that was published in January of 2018, which looked at the mortality outcomes um, after the readmission reduction program was introduced. Uh, and so this particular paper, what they found that among Medicare FFS beneficiaries, um, and this was using Get With The Guidelines and Medicare data, that um, the readmission reduction program was associated with reduction in 30-day and one-year risk adjusted readmissions, but increase in mortality. And the results persisted despite risk adjustment. So this is their conclusions, how they portrayed this, uh, their findings. So then people took to Twitter about with, with, with this paper, started going back and forth. Um, so the uh, 
the first tweet uh, I'm going to uh, show you is from Dr. Harlan Krumpholz, who was one of the um, uh, sort of key people who um, formulated the CMS measures for readmissions. Uh, he uh, quoted the tweet from Dr. Fondra saying that if you believe uh, this, I don't based on your study, wouldn't your first move be to call for your colleagues to stop harming the patient in service of protecting their hospital's bottom line, which is true. You know, like um, that's just a fundamental how physicians should work. And that Dr. Fonro um, then commented that no level of reduction in readmission of cost justifies increase in mortality. And then he uh, goes on to say is that, you know, everyone should come together and look at it, like whether this is um, a feasible policy or not. And then Dr. Krumpholz uh, says, you know, also a key point that we have always looked at mortality and it's always been a focus. Uh, but the readmission and the transition, not so much. Uh, I was taught to discharge patients, not to worry about what happens after that, uh, not by commission, but by omission. So this part, that's why readmission came into the picture. So I know people are going back and forth on like what what what's the right conclusion uh, of. From Yale uh, started doing their own research, like whether the readmissions did actually reduce or and mortality increased or not. And then Rohan Khera, so our, our Rohan Khera, published this paper which looked at uh, the same research question: Did mortality increase after readmission reduction program was introduced? And what did they find? So instead of going to the conclusion, I'm going to show you how Rohan tweeted out. The, uh, the conclusions of his, of his paper. So uh, this is him introducing his study in JAMA Network Open. Um, and then he says, you know, uh, they used interrupted time series. So important, he sh showed us what analysis he used, uh, what outcomes uh, he was looking at, mortality and uh, readmissions. And then um, first, the number of hospitalization declined for all three targeted conditions. That was AMI, heart failure, uh, and pneumonia. Uh, length of stay decreased uh, for AMI pneumonia and then remained unchanged for heart failure. And then the main conclusion was um, that the readmission decrease, inpatient mortality decreased, but 30-day post-discharge mortality did not decrease. So that when this paper was published and I was on Twitter tracking this data, like I was interested in like what, what's going on. And then I had one, one question, like why are studies showing opposite results? Like why is no one talking about, like why is one study showing one result and the other studies are showing different results? And then during this Twitter search, uh, I came across uh, this tweet from Dr. Nalamuthu from, uh, from the University of Michigan says in JAMA Cardiology, letters to the editor this week, Giants, um, HMK Yale and GCFMD, which is Dr. Harlan Krumpholz and Greg Fondo, reignite a key debate about, uh, about readmission reduction impact on mortality. Best piece uh, uh, to me involves discussions of ecological fallacy and importance of aggregate versus unit level effects on policy decisions. Now, a lot in this tweet. So what is he talking about? Uh, I mean, I didn't understand, to be honest, when he tweeted this out, what he's meaning to say. Uh, but once we start looking into the tweet, it's like, okay, that makes sense. He's talking about uh, what is, at what level should we discuss mortality or assess mortality? Is it at the hospital level should be discussed or is it at patient level should be discussed? Like what's the unit of mortality that we are supposed to use? So. Uh, this is a tweet from Dr. Borden. He deleted his account and his tweet, but I found it in archives. Uh, it says that debate is a great one. Possible that lower readmits could be linked to lower mortality in one hospital and higher in another one. So depending on the hospital interventions and context. So clearly needs monitoring uh, together possible as a composite outcome. And then, you know, including length of stay is it's fine. Uh, and then... Um, uh, Dr. Jason Rossi, um, say, agree with Bill. Uh, also, 30-day heart failure mortality was increasing even before the readmission reduction was uh, introduced um, uh, and then uh, much less like implemented. 
And this is a possibility that there was no causality between the readmission reduction program and, um, um, and the increasing mortality rates. Um, this is uh, Dr. Kumar Dharmarajan, ex-faculty here. Um, he also talks about the ecological fallacy uh, concerning here when aggregate trends across the hospitals uh, not corroborated by within the hospital trends. So are you looking at the patient level outcomes? Are you looking at the hospital level outcomes? So I think this is where like I started understanding, okay, it's just like the way you assess or way you design uh, the methodologies for answering one specific research question, you can have a varying degrees of results. That's oh, right. Um, and then Dr. Nalamuth, who concludes, uh, I believe this is what Dr. Krumholz uh, related point. If we see no uptick in mortality at those specific hospitals, then the decreased readmissions um, uh, by themselves are not leading to more deaths, which kind of makes sense. So this was followed up by uh, a couple of more studies uh, from Rohan and Dr. Grumpels. Um, this one was published in uh, BMJ, which looked at the post-discharge acute care and outcomes following readmission reduction initiatives. Um, and then uh, again, I'm just gonna screenshot Rohan's tutorials about the study of how he summarizes. Um, and you know, they um, and he says that we evaluate the concern that increased post-discharge mortality in heart failure and pneumonia was secondary to increase ED and um, OBS unit to avoid readmission. So in order to not have an inpatient admission, the hospitals were just like sending patients to the OBS unit and then just discharging them from the ED and OBS leading to poor care, and then of course, increasing mortality. Uh, and then they tested uh, whether these patients in the ED and OBS unit experienced higher mortality risk uh, in 30 day of discharge. They did not. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that um, uh, I thought going into more granularity of like what the, the methods of, of the research was, um, which they implemented. And then they published a second study uh, where they used even more complicated um, a regression discontinuity framework, looking at 30-day readmission rate and mortality, and then post 30-day readmission rate and mortality to see if there's any discontinuity of care. The idea being, oh, our hospital just not admitting people within 30 days and then admitting them on 31st day so that it doesn't flag them as a readmission. And, uh, Rohan didn't have an extensive tutorial on this. I'm just going to quote uh, uh, the conclusions. Uh, so what they did find was they included 3,200 uh, eligible hospitals. And then the readmission rate from 1 to 30 days was 23%. And then um, 30 to 61 day was 11.4%. Uh, and then the daily readmission uh, rates decreased uh, across most of the 60-day post-discharge uh, with no discontinuities in the local polynomial regression for readmission at the 30-day mark. So uh, they tested out, I'm not gonna go through like the metrics of what they used and what methodologies they used, it's beyond the scope of today's talk, but just, just to highlight how uh, all of this was ignited because people were debating on Twitter. So these came out because people were questioning the policy, they were, um, you know, being very vocal on Twitter uh, and people received it. They thought, okay, we need to investigate this further. And then they published some very impressive studies eventually. Um, uh, sort of kudos to, uh, to the team that they followed up uh, so extensively and went to the bottom of this in order to find out whether the, uh, uh, the policy was successful or not when it came to mortality. And then they said that there was uh, no evidence that clinicians adopted strategies that specifically deferred admissions. All right, so uh, these are all my slides. I'm gonna hand over to Imran to complete uh, the second half of the, uh, uh, the talk. So um, I'm gonna start off with uh, kind of taking a step back to something that Sabine had already talked about and Kardashian index and um, how, uh, you know, how we view media on Twitter and also who the top cardiologists on Twitter are. So there's actually a paper that came out, uh, I believe this was in 2020 or 2021. Um, and they basically looked at all of the top cardiologists on Twitter. Uh, 
So here's the top 10 and they only counted up to the top 100. I don't think Dr. Miller was on there, uh, but Dr. Crum <laughs> Dr. Krumholtz is on here at number nine, and uh, Mike Gibson is number one. And um, I actually had trouble reconciling the fact that he had 430,000 followers. Uh, it's a little astonishing. And then there's a bunch of other people on there too who are you know, just as important. But I just wanted to highlight, you know, some people have actually looked at this stuff and you can go through the list. I thought it was interesting, but we also have um, our H index rankings, which we use sort of as a more traditional metric of how we sort of view academics and cardiology. And here's the rankings that I was able to pull up from uh, the scientific index of 2024. And here you've got Salim Yusuf on there, Harlan Krumholtz is on there again. So I guess not a Kardashian, if I could do the math roughly. Um, and then there's other people on there like Greg Bonnero, um, Chris Cannon, and a bunch of other folks on here as well. So. What, um, what are the primary things that these people do? So the top 100 people, by and large, 88% uh, of them are cardiologists, but 5% of them are just journalists. Um, and then there's a couple of surgeons there and patient representatives. I don't know what that means. Um, and then I wanted to also share, you know, what are the um, practice locations of the top 100 most influential people in cardiology? And I think this highlights that perhaps there's a little bit of a regional bias. So a large chunk of these people are in Massachusetts, California, There's a couple um, coming from Texas and New York. And surprisingly, um, Connecticut has 3% of people on there. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And internationally, by and large, you know, the large majority of people are from the UK and Canada. Um, and then this slide uh, just goes through um, what are the specialties of these top 100 people. Um, and it's a little difficult to make out, but on the bottom, by and large, interventional cardiologists make up the largest number of people on Twitter, the most popular or most followed people. And it must be all of the cool angiograms that they post all the time. Um, and then you've got general cardiology right above them, electrophysiology, cardiac non-invasive imagers. So they're part of that um, discussion, preventive cardiologists. And then surprisingly, uh, cardiology fellows are a little bit more popular than cardio-oncologists <laughs> and heart transplant doctors. So um, with that sort of um, in the background, I want to look through um, some of the data and some of the media that was coming out at the time of Orbita. And I didn't realize uh, Rachel Lamy is coming in March, so this will be pertinent. Um, so we'll all remember that Orbita came out, I think, in 2017, 2018, around that time. And basically, um, it was mentioned 800 times on Twitter within the first day of publication. And this was really popular and really um, you know, stirring up the pot because it was a sham controlled trial. Um, and the primary endpoint of this trial, um, comparing patients with stable angina was exercise time on the treadmill. And we'll all remember that the trial was powered for superiority, but failed to meet that, that primary endpoint. So everyone sort of um, got upset, especially the interventional cardiologists and even um, the New York Times had this really um, sensational headline. It said, unbelievable, heart stents fail to ease chest pain. If you actually look through the article, um, you know, there's some interesting things in there, but I wanted to pull out one quote in particular. They said, a procedure used to relieve chest pain in hundreds of thousands of patients each year is useless for many of them, researchers reported on Wednesday. So um, not only was this being sensationalized on Twitter, but even the New York Times had a pretty sensationalized article on this. And I actually went back and looked if they covered anything about Orbita 2, which was just published in November, and there's not a single word in the New York Times. There's no follow-up article to this. Um, here's a tweet from Ron Waxman, um, also seems to be a little sensationalized. So don't nail the coffin shut on PCI just yet at the Sky discussion centered on the fact that in Orbita, 85% of the control arm opted for PCI after the trial. So there was a lot of talk that, you know, especially on Twitter, uh, that PCI for stable angina was dead. I wanna pull up um, 
Fred Stone's tweets, which I found really interesting. So he says, actually, the results of the blinded orbiter trial, a small single center study, were exactly the same as prior unblinded trials in terms of angina relief. And you can add ischemia to this slide. This results fit perfectly. So to do a little bit of fact checking, I think the first one was pretty easy. Um, it was conducted across five centers, so it wasn't, in fact, a small single center study. Um, and it was powered to detect an effect size of 30 seconds um, change in exercise time. And um, in, some of the, uh, in some of the comments um, after the study came out, you know, people did the, um, the power calculations, and they found that you know, to detect a, an effect size of 15 seconds on the treadmill, it would take 800 patients. And I think that you know, points to two things to me. Um, 15 seconds is probably not clinically relevant. I don't think I ever see a patient in clinic and tell them, hey, I'm going to start you on a beta blocker and you're going to go for 15 extra seconds on the modified boost protocol, right? <laughs> um, and the second thing is, you know, 800 patients probably not be feasible. And then the second thing, um, you know, in one of his follow-up tweets, he noted um, that there were many patients with no ischemia and normal exercise stress test when that also wasn't um, factually accurate. In fact, 94% um, of patients, either through a non-invasive or invasive method, had um, evidence of ischemia. And the mean FFR was 0.69 in that study, and the mean IFR was 0.76. So um, I think as I was going through a lot of these tweets from people, I started to... Um, Kind of walk back um, and think about how we view Twitter and how we consume Twitter. I think when we open up a study, we can easily see, you know, people's um, uh, correspondence addresses. We can see their disclosures, and on Twitter, we don't see people's disclosures. So um, these are Greg Stone's twi uh, disclosures, right? And you can see, um, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, that you know a lot of research money coming from industry here. So Abbott and Abiomed and you know, the list can go, the list was actually quite long. I didn't put the whole thing in here, but I think I just wanted to highlight that, you know, some of the safeguards that we have in our traditional journals um, aren't exactly present when we're using Twitter. Um, so then I, I wanted to just fact check one more thing. Um, and again, it's surprising that someone like Greg Stone is, is saying things like this, but he said, you know, it's hard to show reduced angina with, in patients um, that are asymptomatic and, and to pull up the slides in the appendix or the, um, the, uh, the figures in the appendix. And because of the way the trial was designed, because of the run-in period, there in fact was a significant portion of patients who actually didn't have angina at the time that they were being treated. But at enrollment, you can see all of the patients did in fact have angina. So I'm going to just move on a little bit. Um, this is Professor Daryl Francis. Um, he's one of the uh, co-authors on the Orbita trial. I don't know who he's referring to by Professor uh, Stonk Egger. Any guesses out there? Um, but he was pointing out that you know one of the criticisms that they received was that you know the patients um, were going for 8.5 minutes on Bruce protocol, but that made them athletes. And I think we'll all remember. Um, that the first two stages are technically classified as warm-up stages on, on the modified boost protocol. And then finally, there was a reply to one of his tweets um, that made a really good point. It said, um, you know, Orbit has certainly made it safer to defer PCI for stable angina. I've probably done less stenting since its publication and probably to the benefit of the patient. But how many of your angina patients are you calling three times a week to titrate meds? And I think that's a really good point. And when we read these studies, we have to understand that, you know, the study protocols may not be pragmatic and translatable to what we do in actual clinical practice. Um, I am lucky to uh, have clinic once every two weeks here, so it's hard to follow up with patients um, every, uh, every week or so. And this is from the study protocol. Um, showing how rigorous they were. So after enrollment, patients spent the first six weeks in the medical therapy optimization phase of the protocol in which they had telephone consultations with a consultant cardiologist one to three times per week. And this shows you how meticulous this study was. Um, on the right side, they show um, how many patients were on respective medications, so beta blockers, aspirin, statins, calcium channel blockers, renolazine, both at the time of enrollment and at the time of treatment. 
And they also noted that the up titration focused on antianginal therapy aiming for at least two antianginal therapies per patient, which is probably more than we can accomplish even in six weeks, I'd say. Um, so I'm gonna follow up with Orbita 2, which was actually just published in November as well. And surprisingly, um, even though it was published in the New England Journal, I don't think it received the same amount of press um, that Orbita 1 received. Um, so this was a multicenter, um, double-blind, randomized sham controlled trial, and these patients were off anti-anginal therapy. I think that was one of the key criticisms of Orbita 1. And instead of using a treadmill um, time, uh, this time they used an angina symptom score. And I'll share one of um, the most useful tweets that I probably could find for this study uh, on Twitter. So this is uh, Roxana Mehran. And uh, this was actually sort of a helpful tweet, I gotta say. Um, you know, it's a little bit um, more informational. I think it's a little bit more factual. So it tells you how many patients there were, what the follow-up uh, time was, what the primary endpoint was. And I think she makes a pretty good point at the end that you know, despite there being no difference in uh, anti-anginal symptoms, or sorry, in anti-anginal medications, uh, there are still high residual symptoms. Um, and literally the thread was just full of kind of nonsense, useless comments. Um, and then here's the table from the New England Journal that you know actually shows that what she said was factually accurate. Uh, and then I'll just note that Greg Stone um, seems like this study made him happy. So he, he replied to this. He said, after ischemia in orbita, I no longer believe that optical medical ther or, uh, optimal medical therapy is first line treatment for stable CAD not if symptomatic patients want the best chance to maximally improve quality of life. And then I just want to point out um, this, um, this tweet saw about 76,000 views, so not as much as Evan's picture. Um, but the actual New England Journal article for Orbita 2 barely hit probably 10,000. This um, graph right there shows you um, the number of page views that, that the study got from when it was accessed through the New England Journal. So we're clearly consuming a lot of our medical information through Twitter and not actually going to the primary literature to actually fact check what we're seeing on Twitter. So I'm gonna end, um, this will be, I, I promise the, the last tweet that you guys will see for the afternoon. So um, I just wanna take all the stuff that we've seen and apply it, uh, and apply it. And so this is kind of what um, Hanny Raghi is doing in his tweet here. So here's a 47 year old, um, you can see a pretty tight stenosis there in the LAD and he uh, throws out a poll and he says, um, how many of you um, would choose optimal, optimal uh, only medical therapy and how many of you would PCI versus cabbage? And the overwhelming majority, it looks like 64, 65% said they'd PCI. But I think, you know, it brought up um, an important, uh, I think the, the thread brought up some important things that we need to consider. And I think sometimes what we do is we consider uh, trial results and studies and data in vacuum, and we don't think about the patient um, in, in general and the other things that may be going on. So um, one of the comments was, you know, why did this patient get a diagnostic angio at the age of 47? And so the reply was, you know, they got a coronary CTA and there was a significant proximal LED stenosis. So what would we do about that? And I wanted to look into it and that sort of um, brought me to this next study. So Scott Hart looked um, at uh, stable angina or stable chest pain and this was a study that looked at coronary CT um, in patients who had stable angina versus standard of care. And what they found was that there was a lower rate of death from coronary heart disease and non-fatal MI at five years compared to standard care alone. And there was um, more data that came out of this study that showed that non-calcified plaque um, was associated with an increase or a 4% 4, 4 increase uh, of risk in um, fatal or non-fatal MIs. So where does that bring us with the guidelines? So there's new um, chronic coronary disease guide, oops, sorry. Where does that bring us with the, um, in terms of the new guidelines? So um, in patients with chronic coronary disease and lifestyle limited angina, despite 
GDMT and significant coronary artery stenosis, amenable to revascularization. Revascularization is recommended to improve symptoms. So I've mostly pulled out just information or just uh, guideline recommendations and the new guidelines that were relevant to the Orbita trial. So this was one of the um, this was one of the recommendations that was influenced by the Orbita trial. And then this was the only other recommendation. So despite all of the um, all of the all of the uh, all of the highlights that that Orbita got throughout the last few years, it only ended up making it into two sentences basically in the trial. So the second one um, that I found was in the Orbita trial, PCI objectively reduced ischemia assessed by dobutamine stress echo. And although Seattle angina questionnaire scores did not defer among participants, PCI resulted in more patient reported freedom from angina than placebo. Patients with greater ischemia burdens were more likely to have lower angina frequency score and freedom from angina with PCI than the sham procedure. And so these guidelines were um, published before Orbita 2 came out. And um, there was also a couple of things about coronary CT in there. So features on coronary CT can, in fact, be used for risk stratification according to, um, to the new guidelines. So what are sort of the key takeaways from all of the drama behind Orbita 1 and Orbita 2? So for me, um, you know, the pendulum's always swinging. So uh, a couple of years ago, everyone said that PCI for stable angina was pretty much done and that we would never do that again. And I think Orbita 2, which is a follow-up study that didn't receive as much press as Orbita 1, I think challenges that notion. And I think at the end of the day, um, what we do is difficult. And I think shared decision-making remains at the center of um, patient-physician interactions. And we can't rely on one single trial to or one single tweet um, to basically make all our decisions for our patients for us. I think it's still appalling that, you know, 76,000 people saw the tweet for Orbita 2, but never actually clicked on the study, right? Um, patients may not be willing to take medications um, due to their side effects. So treating them for stable angina with medications only may not be a viable strategy if some patients just don't want to take medications. And um, trial endpoints may be difficult to contextualize for patients. So um, I've never in my clinic told a patient that, you know, um, starting them on a beta block will help them go 15 seconds on a treadmill. And finally, I think coronary CT um, and FFR are evolving, and I think they'll help us figure out, um, you know, what to do with these patients and help us inform, you know, the decisions that we make alongside our patients. And I'll sort of leave us with um, the 2023 guideline um, for uh, management of patients with chronic coronary disease, they have a nice figure in here that shows us all the things that we should consider when making a shared decision with our patients. So things like social support, socioeconomic factors, health literacy are all important. Um, what their nutrition's like, what their um, clinical expertise is like is also important. And I'll end, or uh, sorry, um, I've got one quote um, from Osler. So the good physician treats the disease, the disease, uh, the great physician uh, treats the patient who has the disease. And I'll just end with what I think is sort of an optimal way to share um, some of our data from our research, or even you know if we're trying to give some um, education online. So here's uh, an example of an anatomy of a tutorial. So uh, Tony Brew is a hospitalist over at the VA in Boston. I, um, he's one of my attendings over there, and he's really into medical education, and he was. Um, really into uh, tutorials, and he's got a list of them online. If you go to his Twitter, he's got a Google Documents list that has about 100 of them. And he sort of follows this sort of premise here. And so the first tweet um, is used to hook your uh, audience and establish the premise of the thread. Then sort of the middle tweets um, give a narrative core, and they may use polls. They may have visual, um, visual diagrams and links. And then the closing tweet is supposed to summarize the key messages and recommend the next steps for the interested learners. So here's an example. So which of the following electro tests slash treatments can lead to T wave changes seen below? So EEG, ECT, EMG. So we'll see diffuse T wave inversions throughout. Correct answer is ECT. And then, you know, he goes on to give the explanation. And then he also gives sort of a postscript. Um, so I'm just going to leave us with two more slides. So um, 
go, I, I'm going to go through the pros of Twitter. So it's an open discussion forum. Um, information can be rapidly disseminated to large audiences. There's no subscription fees or paywalls. Uh, tutorials can make topics more easy to digest. And then the cons of Twitter, there's probably too many to just list here, but these were the ones that I sort of thought of as um, the main ones. So disinformation can be easily spread. There's uh, conflicts of interest that are not readily apparent online. Um, information may be misinterpreted by laypersons. And the algorithm that's used to display things on your Twitter feed or that props people up to the number one um, on, a, on a certain metric is proprietary and results in information can be sensationalized. And then finally, um, 280 characters is probably not sufficient to capture the nuance of, of the topics that are relevant to all of us. And um, that's pretty much all we've got. Thank you. <laughs> so that was a very inter entertaining grand rounds. Um, I do feel though, I, I kind of need a Hibba cleanse shower at this point because I feel like I've been dragged through the muck of medical social media uh, at this point. And so I, but I, I think I want you, I want to understand one of your two conclusions. Is it, do you feel that the s social media influencers are doing a service? in in how they're presenting their data or are you warning us about the, all the perils that appear to be present in how certain folks are influencing the discourse and i point to the 2021 chest pain guidelines as example number one of how this uh uh this whole scenario goes awry So I, I, I think it's, it's difficult to parse out what, um, what is factual on there, right? And I think um, I'll be the first to admit, I don't read every trial that comes out in the New England Journal, right? So uh, some of us do need a way to kind of um, be, uh, be in the know and kind of have a sense of what else is going on. And it's a good way to kind of get a sense of what might be going on in a field that's not, you know, um, within your area of expertise or specialty. But um, I think, you know, if we're going to be making decisions for patients, I think we can't just use one single tutorial or one single tweet to, to you know, take our next clinic patient who has like a 70 or 80% proximal um, LAD stenosis and tell them, you know, um, the ischemia trial showed this, so we're not going to stent you, right? Um, and so I think um, my main takeaway from this was that every time I read it, a tweet from now on, I'm going to have to think about who wrote it, what, what their, um, what their sort of ulterior motives are and, and what else is going on. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Oh, thank you. So I wanted to follow up Ed's question because there were two things that really struck me, um, you know, focusing more on the message uh, on the medium here rather than the message. I thought, first of all, I take a step back. I want to commend you. This was just a fabulous grand rounds. I thought both of you guys did a great job at sort of going back and forth between the content and the medium and, and you know, focusing on both aspects. But I want to uh, follow up Ed's uh, question about the, the medium. Um, there were two things that really struck me. Um, when I, I'm going to show my age here, but when I was in junior high, I used to read Mad Magazine, and there was a section that was called Snappy Answers to Stupid Questions, and it really, so much of what creates a strong Twitter voice is sort of this cleverness that, to me, seems like it sort of, um, you know, outweighs uh, the actual data, the thoughtful, you know, the thoughtfulness. And as a corollary to that, something I found incredibly striking was that of all the tweets you showed, only two were by women. One was by Martha Galati, who I, I don't know, one by Roxana Moran that I do. Both of them were just 
information. And so I think that it it privileges a type of or, or elevates a type of discourse that um, really differs a lot between men and women. And I, and I think it the type of discourse it encourages is um, very uh, uh, specific, and I'm not sure it's always the type of discourse we, we want. So I, I would be curious, uh, you know, sort of how you how you think about that aspect of the the medium. Yeah, um, that's a great point, Dr. Lampard. So um, you know, traditionally uh, and unfortunately, cardiology has been like um, a male dominated field. Even though now it's changing, and we have, you know, ACCHA all coming out um, with women in cardiology initiatives. Um, and then just from like, you know, um, as, as a cardiology fellow who's on Twitter and sees all these tweets, um, I can definitely say male cardiologists have a way of sensationalizing their, their tweets uh, more so than the women cardiologists um, in a bad way. Um, to be honest, most of the tweets that we shared uh, were very, uh, uh, in a way, not just portraying what the data is, but make spinning it in a way as uh, Dr. Gross tutorial said, hooking the um, the audience into their um, into their tweets, uh, gaining more audience. So social media is all about um, tracking uh, audience and sensationalizing rather than it's about um, uh, disseminating clinical information. Um, Dr. Martha Gulati's tweet that, that I used and Dr. Mehran's tweet that uh, Imran used were very distinct clinical data that they were presenting, which may not be um, as appealing to a lay person who is viewing those tweets, um, which most of the audience is actually non-medical audience who are viewing these tweets. So for them, for patients, even though Factually, those tweets make more sense. Um, they may not be as appealing to someone who doesn't have a medicine background. So I think most of like the male cardiologists on Twitter just make them more sensationalizing, which in a good way and a bad way sort of tracks what Imran highlighted that tweets may gain 70,000 views, but you know the views on the, on the actual study it's less than like a tenth of the views. So I think it all boils down to um, just like how the, the tweets are phrased to make it more sort of appealing to uh, a lay audience than, than actually sharing the clinical data, which is one of our biggest critiques of how the medical information is relayed on Twitter. Mani. That was exciting and fun to review. And it, I think just, I, I was going to ask something that was similar to like what Rachel's question was, which is like in this, we're living in this big, big, big moment of like universities and education and diversity of thinking and, um, you know, exchange, right? And then you have like the boldness of like Twitter, like where you're capturing diversity of thought, people willing to take a risk and put, put themselves out there. And I wondered like, you know, maybe just back to you, like in your research, are you able to like follow the trends of that discourse? Um, like the tone of it, who's participating in the debate, like some of those, um, exchanges, some of the more, um, like controversial ones were, you know, even just like four years ago where the, the, the rhetoric was different at that time. And, you know, is there some way that we can reflect on whether or not this is the best medium for promoting those kinds of diversity of thinking? And you brought some of the issues out front, like of like, what's the, you know, conflict of interest behind this person? Like how voracious are their findings? Um, you know, what's the motive behind these tweets? And like, how do you reconcile all that? Because everybody wants you to put your Twitter feed when they want to promote your paper. And then there's this obligation to participate. And then there's also the filtering of how do you get to the good stuff when you're just bombarded by a lot of junk and other things that might just be, you know, clouding our judgment. Right, so uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, very heavy and interesting points. and. 
you know, uh, rightfully so. Um, so the first part, um, can we sort of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're asking like, is there a way to sort of analyze these tweets of what spectrum they fall into and how they're disseminating information? There is, there is a way, uh, hasn't been done in cardiology. Uh, there's an uh, uh, R package, um, which is a sentiment analysis of the tweets where you can use Twitter's open API and download all the tweets and then can run sentiment analysis. It's scores from uh, almost like a, a, a linear scale, whether it's like a positive or a negative. Um, hasn't been done in cardiology. It will be an interesting thing to see. And then of course you can, uh, you know, um, sort of quantify like uh, female physicians, male physicians, uh, trainees, non-trainees, years since graduation. Uh, but hasn't been done on uh, specifically cardiologists. Uh, most of the tweets that have been analyzed, they are from non-medicine uh, and they have shown like pretty neutral responses. So it'll be curious to look at. Uh, coming down to the second uh, aspect, like how to sort of segregate all this information and take, take home or like what's the right thing. So that, that, that's the biggest issue, like, and I don't know if there's any right way to do it. Uh, and that's like the highlight of our grand rounds is that there's, there's, it's really difficult to sort of sift through what's important, what's not important, what's, um, uh, what's useful and what is not useful. Um, something may be useful to me and may not be use, useful to a different physician. So it's, it's really not a right way. And that's where like everything hinges on that all this information, but we don't yet have a standardized right way to absorb this information because Twitter was not meant for medical education. Um, you know, X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok was, even though we are using it, uh, like Yale School of Public Health does a lot of TikTok videos, um, but it wasn't designed to disseminate education. So it's our responsibility how we absorb it, but that's just something to keep in mind. So I, I don't have a, like um, an honest answer to like what's the right way to absorb uh, information from Twitter. The best we can do is you know what what Imran highlighted, like look who's tweeting, uh, make sure we go and look at the studies that that are published. So I think those two steps are probably uh, the crux, and everything else is up to the reader, like how they want to absorb. It. So it was a very uh, kind of thought-provoking uh, discussion. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. So <clears throat> you, you mentioned that one of the reasons for Twitter being in a successful platform is that you don't have time to go to New England Journal every day. The information is up there. Uh, one way to look at it is actually is that maybe actually the readers of these tweeters, or the followers at least, they don't try their own, uh, trust their own judgment, but want to see what is the expert opinion. What are the other people thinking? That you can actually study by seeing how, who is getting more followers and how many of these tweets have, have followed. Because, you know, some people maybe even reading the New England Journal will say, okay, what do I make out of it? And let me see what Harold Broomholz think about it, Top Eric Topol about it. The second thing is actually, if you look at it, Twitter has an impact on the journal uh, appearance. If you look at it in, in a New England Journal, never had this form of now summarizing in two lines, these guys did this study, the conclusion was this making it like a Twitter thank you. And it would be actually interesting to look to see if that has actually caused more readers going to New England Journal and not trying themselves to look at it. And compare these two together to see how much they trust their own judgment, how much they have to go listen to the external. So that's actually a really good point. And um, I think some journals like The Lancet actually has a sort of like a citation section and, and then uh, like a metric section that you can go through and figure out how many times that study is getting linked through different sources. So you can see who's reading it on Facebook and you can see who's coming to that study from Twitter and you can see all the different sources um, that are um, leading to people coming to that specific study. And um, that would be interesting to look yeah, at. Yeah, most actually. people don't have metrics now, even JCI. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that'll conclude our grand rounds. Thank you, Imran and Sabine.